today we are here to uh, do what I'm guessing might be the final uh, of the entries in my series, reviewing the big budget Branagh adaptations of the Poirot novels. And man, what an interesting, interesting movie I saw last night. First of all, I didn't review this when it came out because it was during the writers and actors strike and I just like wasn't the, the guidelines for social media influencers. I just felt like I wanted to err on the side of not talking about it. Um, so I was waiting until it came to Hulu, which it did. And can I just say, I'm now, now that I've seen it, I'm canceling Hulu because like this ad situation is so annoying. I can't believe I'm paying to see ads. Like that just feels crazy to me. Anyway, so that somewhat broke up the tension while I was watching because it would be in the middle of a very like climactic moment. And then it would be like, talk to your doctor about this prescription medicine for a disease you don't have. I should mention this first section is gonna be mostly spoiler free. I mean, if you don't wanna hear any details about the movie, Movie, then don't watch this, but I'm not going to give away anything solution or whatever. So first section spoiler free and I will tell you when we're transitioning. So okay, if you have been watching my channel and you know my history with these movies, you may wonder what I thought about this one because I am on record at appreciating that these movies exist because it brought brings people to the franchise, like it brings people in to read the books, which I love. Uh, I also like adaptations of books, like I'm not somebody who thinks they're always bad. I definitely have Christie adaptations that I think are great. See my obsession with the 1970s Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile. Oh my god, I love those. I like um, ITV's Poro. I'm down for an adaptation. And I even have liked um, some of those recent, I think it's on the BBC, the, the big prestige like Dark Christie where they're adapting a lot of the standalones like And Then There Were None and... I think this year they did murder. I think they're doing murder is easy this year. Those. I've liked some of those. Some of them I think are more successful than others, but they're interesting. Like they're, I, I think they're at least worth seeing. Uh, like The Pale Horse. I didn't love that one, but I thought it was interesting. So I'm not against adaptations, but I have not been a fan of these Poirot adaptations so far, just because in my opinion, the mistake that the first two movies made very heavily was assuming that the audience doesn't care about the murder mystery and that they needed to jazz it up. So they needed to give Poirot like dark, sad boy backstory. I'm an edgelord now. Mm. And then they also needed to make him an action hero, <laughs> even though he's an old man. You know, like I, I just felt like they their interpretation of the Poirot character was both not true to the books and to the source material, but also I felt kind of infantilizing to the audience of like, like, you guys aren't gonna like just a straight up murder mystery. We know, we know we're gonna jazz this up. And it's like, my friends, my beloved. No, <laughs> people love mysteries. That's like, at least in the US, ABC, NBC, like all of those kind of staple primetime channels, more than half of their primetime lineup is some version of a mystery, right? Like people like mysteries, just lean into that. So that has been my big critique of the first two, is that they fundamentally didn't respect the audience's intelligence and buy into the genre as a whole. They also, I think, had the misfortune of picking some of the like biggest Christie titles that are very well known and loved and also already have already had great adaptations. So it's like inviting comparison to existing great adaptations of those works and they just fell short every time. Now, was some of the production value good? Yes, though I felt like especially the second one looked very CGI in a way that kind of felt like plasticky and distracting. But like the costumes were beautiful. Sort of the ambiance I thought was great. They obviously are not skimping on paying for good actors. Like, you know, I felt like there was a lot of money thrown into them, but their t fundamental take was just not great. So I am happy to report that this movie I think is far and away the best of the three. I thought it was entertaining. I thought that they fixed some of the things that bothered me in the previous adaptations, especially with the interpretation of Poro, and with um, respecting the audience being interested in the mystery. It's very focused on being both horror and having a mystery component. So they also went, I, I felt like that was a choice that really worked to make it an entertaining film. Um, I have other things that we'll get to that are critiques, but I do want to start by saying far and away, this is the best of the three. 
I think also the production design of this was gorgeous. I loved the visual language of it and how they interpreted the Halloween element. I thought that was so beautiful. And I think that this is a really, like this came out, I think around Halloween. This is such a fun Halloween movie. Like if you're looking for something that's scary, but not over the top, like gory or so scary that if you're a little bit of a chicken, you can't watch it. I think that this has like a nice balance of some really good atmosphere and then some good like jump scares. So I thought this was great as a Halloween movie. Um, I thought this was the best that Brenna has done with Poirot. Like he toned down a lot of the things that I thought were not working in his performance previously and really just focused on Poirot's internal struggle in this one, which is like kind of what is his meaning in retirement, as well as does like, is the supernatural thing real? Like that conflicts with everything he believes. So I thought that this was a much more focused and plausible rendering of the Poirot character and an interpretation I could get on board with. So I really appreciate that. I, th I thought that as a lover and fan of the Poirot books, I mean, I just realized I haven't given my credentials if you happen upon this video. Obsessed with Agatha Christie. I had a whole series, like, I've read every one of her books now under the Agatha Christie name. I don't love the Mary Westmacott stuff. But like, I've had several series on this channel doing rereads of those books and analyzing them. I've been on Christie podcasts. I did a video for the International Agatha Christie. Like, I, I'm a known Christie head. I love Agatha Christie. And as somebody who does love Poirot, I felt like this was an interpretation of him that was different than the book, but one that I could get on board with and made sense to me. Like, it was still meaningfully Poirot in some way. So I appreciated that. And then I also, I believe her name is Kelly Riley. She plays Rowena Drake. And I thought she gave a great performance. To me, she was far and away the best in the cast. And I thought she did a really good job. So I really liked her performance. And just as like a locked, like a, a locked room murder mystery, basically, or sort of an isolated closed circle mystery. They're in this palazzo. There's only a certain number of people who can have done the thing. There's this really bad storm so they can't get out via the canals and Poirot locks them all in after a murder has happened. Like keeping it focused, making it a, a more focused horror mystery story, I thought really worked for the overall entertainment factor. So overall, I like I said, I think this is far and away the best of them. This was like a good movie. However, <laughs> transitioning into some of my critique. Why, why Halloween party? Like this is nothing like the book. <laughs> so like, literally, I have no idea why they even pretended that this was an adaptation of Halloween party. Yes, the character names are the same. So they have a lot of the same character names. And there are moments and set pieces from the book, like the whole bobbing for apples thing, the fact that it is a children's Halloween party. Um, there, There's definitely like, you see nods to the source material. But when I tell you the plot could not be more different. So Joyce Reynolds, for example, in the movie adaptation, she is played by Michelle Yu. Yo? Yo? I think that's how you say her name. Great actress, just won an Academy Award. She is not very good in this movie, but she is playing a, a psychic medium named Joyce Reynolds. In the book, Joyce Reynolds is the victim of the murder that kicks off the book. And she is a, I think like 13 year old child. So just from that comparison, you know, out the gate that like the plot is gonna have to be wildly different because the original victim, polar opposites, like older psychic lady, young, annoying teen, total difference. Yeah, so I thought that was, I guess like, I, I was trying to think about this as, as I was mulling on this, cause I watched it last night and getting my day going here. So I'm filming this first thing in the morning. like why was this the approach? Why do you even need it to be Poirot? Like, I guess that's kind of where I'm, I'm landing that. I mean, if you want my like bottom line, I, I have a lot more to say, but like my kind of takeaway is why even tether this to a Poirot book? Seems like a perfectly good, like late forties, early fifties, Spooky, you know, spooky, scary skeletons movie. Why did you even need to bring Poirot the character in? The only thing is just that it has that name recognition and that's how you get the funding for the project. 
I mean, that's really all I can think. I mean, the, the idea of picking a lesser known Christie to adapt, I think is smart. I think that's part of the strategy, the, the, um, I believe, like I said, I think it's the BBC. Maybe it's ITV, but I'm pretty sure it's the BBC is doing. They have a lot of the like lesser known Christies that haven't been adapted a million times. Some of that is rights reasons, but I also just think like artistically, it's a good choice because there's less of a, you know, you, you don't have to live up to people's expectations in the same way. So like I'm here for them picking kind of a more obscure Christie. The other thing is that Halloween Party, while I have a lot of affection for it because it was one of the two first books I ever read from Agatha Christie, it was that and The Hollow, is a lesser Poirot. I mean it it's still entertaining. I think it definitely, I mean it was hello, it was good enough to hook me into being obsessed with Agatha Christie. It doesn't make sense to me from like a plot perspective why that would be the one because it's just kind of a weird plot and it does center around the murder of this child and yeah it, it's an interesting it's a very of its time book too for when it came out and sort of like where cultural discourse was on mass murderers and things like that like the, anyway that's a side note. It's an interesting book but it's not one of her great ones and it's also not like a hidden gem. So like um I'm trying to think of an example like The Pale Horse for instance that was one of the ones that they did an adaptation of recently. I love that book. I thought that was a great Christie and it is it's not one of the first ones people think of for her but the plot is there. It's an interesting book. It has interesting things to say about the nature of supernatural. Actually great comparison because it's also playing with like is it supernatural or not? The the source material I think has interesting things to say about like our assumptions and like the nature of wanting to believe in something supernatural and like why that plays into human and psyche. Like I think it has interesting things to say. So like that makes complete sense to me is like okay here's one people might not know about but there's like interesting things going on here and it has a solid plot to build on. That's not a Halloween party, I don't think. It, or at least it's not the one I would have thought of. And then if you're gonna adapt it, like it, like I just, I said, it is just such a polar opposite plot. It's also, this movie is taking a horror approach to it, which I think, again, is kind of an interesting angle and I like it as a take, but I guess I just keep coming back to like, why is Poirot even here? Why is this even based on an Agatha Christie book? It's a good movie and a good plot, but it's just not, it's so divorced from it. So it ends up kind of feeling like, well, we had to do this to get the funding. I don't know. It, it just, I, that's honestly kind of my big takeaway is just, why? Why did we do this? Like, why is Poirot here? <laughs> why, why do we have, you know, creepy crawly Poirot? I don't know. Like, it's just, why is just honestly my biggest takeaway from this entire film. So that's my overall, I think, pretty spoiler free. I forgot to mention that. Spoiler free, mostly section. And my biggest point is just why. Okay, moving into some spoilers. So first of all, the thing that I had the biggest issue with in this movie that I did not like, made me resent them even having the Poirot source material, was their treatment of the character of Ariadne Oliver. Ariadne Oliver is a GD delight. She's so fun in the books. She's so kind of like flighty and kind of stupid, but not. Like she's she's got this sort of sly cleverness to her and she is clearly Agatha Christie's stand-in. So Agatha Christie takes, you know, gentle ribs at her. She's just, anytime she shows up in a book, it's a welcome addition. She's just a great character. So first of all, not only is Tina Fey the worst actor in this entire thing, and it's, I don't, I don't know how to convey to you how amateurish, flat, and terrible her performance is in this movie. It's awful. So she's not only being played terribly, they make her part, like, a bad guy. And they make her, like, resentful and hate, hateful towards Poirot, which is, a take. I mean, I can respect it as a take, but it just to me seems to fundamentally misunderstand some of like what is fun about these books. Like nobody wants to see that. Who wants to see mean, jealous, petty, vengeful Ariadne Oliver? Not me. Who wants to? I don't know. That was just not something I needed at all. I will say in general, the acting in this is pretty poor. I thought that, like I said, Kelly Riley, I thought was heads and shoulders the best actress in this. I thought that was great. And then um, I also thought the uh, ex-fiance was pretty good. And I thought Kenneth Branagh did a pretty good job. Everybody else was like fine to bad, pretty much. 
the other, so <laughs> the other thing is, uh, Christian Gray shows up in this and he is not good. And then they have to have the obligatory action scene. So they have to have him and the chef have this brawl. And then holy parentified child, Batman, like Leopold, who in the book is Joyce's little brother in the movie is the child of Christian Gray. And his dad is this like, tormented, mentally unwell, you know, PTSD from the war person. And Leopold is so parentified, it was deeply uncomfortable to the point that he's literally like tucking his father into bed and kissing him on the forehead. It was just like, Leopold, I need you to get out of this situation. This is so unhealthy and uncomfortable. But that like they had to have the action scene and they did that. And I was like, okay, guys, I get it. You, you, you gotta mix it up. I think that's, some of it is maybe they just don't get how to have subtler action to break up the different like murder investigation interviews. Maybe that's part of the root cause of the problem here is that they just, I don't know. Murder in the Orient Express from the 70s is such a masterclass in there not being a ton of action, but like making these small breaks from the discussions that the different characters are having or like the different interviews feels so impactful and suspenseful. Like I'm thinking of the, the robe scene. Like it's not like there's anything crazy happening, but there's just so, you know, the robe falls out of the, the compartment above and just like that breaks up the action a little bit. And I just don't think that these movies have ever figured out how to do that subtly. Like the only thing they can really think of is like, let's have a fight. That'll wake the audience up. So anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I thought all of that was kind of wild. And I do think, I thought that the solution was kind of fun. I was into that. I was into the the honey, it was definitely foreshadowed pretty heavily. So I knew something with the honey was the problem. But I thought that was all like effectively done. It was good, you know, clue seeding. Um, and I n was pretty sure Rowena was the bad guy in this. But I still thought that that was handled pretty well. Like the clues were were well communicated and the acting of it, I thought got across well. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other things I can say. Cause I don't, I'm okay spoiling the movie. I'm trying not to spoil the book. I will just say in general, like the motive, I wish that the, the who of the whodunit from the book was more alluded to in this movie and something different was done with it. It. I guess you could kind of, s mm, I guess I can kind of see maybe in the solution, a slight nod to the solution of the book, like the movie solution, maybe without spoiling things, I can sort of see some parallel there. But I think it would have been fun if they had had the character from the book who done it be more in this movie because I think that would have for people who had read the book create a nice layer of misdirection that they didn't really go with. Um, they kind of did I think in general that's a critique I have if they were going to use this source material I think it would have been interesting for them to have more nods to it so that it was misdirection and rewarding people who had read the book since they were saying that this was based on the book. And I think I'll just leave it there. So yeah, I think those are my thoughts, which is I think this is a pretty good movie. I would recommend seeing it. It's far and away the best of these three movies. However, it's also not really meaningfully the book at all or meaningfully Christy. So it's like, what does, <laughs> I don't know, what does it say that the one I like the best was not really Agatha Christie at all. I don't know. But I don't think they're making any more of these. I don't think that this last one did well enough. And I have mixed feelings about that. But uh, I do think that this if this is the last one, it was definitely a good note to go out on. Because like I said, it's certainly the best. And I would recommend this if you're looking for a fun Halloween, lightly scary movie that has a strong mystery plot to it. This is really fun, very atmospheric and and worth your time. I think if you're looking for a good adaptation of this book, this is not the movie for you to see. So yeah, I think that will do it for this video and potentially for this little mini series of complaining about these movies. <laughs> but like I said, this one was the most successful. So I'm happy to leave this little series on a little bit more of a positive note. So uh, let me know if you've seen this movie, what you thought of it. If you've also read the book, let me know what you thought of this movie and the ways that it did or didn't align. I'll also, I'll try to remember to link. I have so much Agatha Christie content. So if you're just stumbling across this and you want Want more Christie content, I will link to the relevant playlist somewhere. You can 
peruse more if you're interested. But yeah, I think that'll do it for me. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social means if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, and I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon.